right, we want to thank you for joining us on another episode of TheraFit, a presentation of Holistic Family Solutions, where we engage in health and wellness conversation with leading mental health professionals, parents, and sports talents who share tips, personal stories, and alter alternative therapeutic practices to help your family achieve its most fit life yet. And we're glad you can join us again today. Our guest today is Kim Dellinger. Kim Dellinger is the executive director at Bacon Street in Williamsburg, Virginia. Bacon Street's mission is to provide services to young people and families affected by substance abuse and or mental health issues. Kim, thank you for joining us today on TheraFit. Absolutely. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? Sure. So um, my background is um, I am actually an educator at heart and by training. Um, I'm not a clinician. I think that that's important to um, put that out there and to make that distinction. Um, but I um, kind of uh, happened upon doing substance abuse prevention work about 13 years ago now, I guess it is, and um, did that. I ran an agency in the state of Vermont for about um, eight years doing work with young people and helping them make healthy choices. So. Um, we moved down here to, to uh, Virginia to be close to family. Um, I have two kids and my husband and I wanted to make sure that they were able to be near grandma and grandpa. And so we made that decision and um, I've been here at Bacon Street uh, Youth and Family Services for about two years now, so. Oh, great. So what do you love about your job? Oh, I am never bored, never ever bored. I love the fact that um, I see families and I see young people on a daily basis. Um, I think, um, I feel like I'm making a, a positive difference in our community and helping our clinicians be really um, impactful on the, the community as a whole and to see change in a really positive direction. I think that it's great to see the transition that families go through. They, oftentimes we'll see, I'll see them at the very beginning of their um, experience with us and then I'll see them at the end of our, uh, our experience with them and um, you, you always see a marked difference between those two pieces and it's always very rewarding. Oh, excellent. Yeah. There's nothing like, you know, doing a job that you absolutely love and, you know, it sounds yeah. like you really are into the things that you do. Absolutely. I'm really passionate about young people. Yeah. Now, on our podcast, we uh, we have four quadrants. We uh, we call it the four quadrants of wellness. And so we're going to cycle through the four quadrants. The first quadrant is cognition. The second one is fitness. The third one is nutrition. And the fourth is spirituality. And what we'd like to do is try to really uh, hit each one of those, ask some direct questions uh, about how those affect, you know, and in your case, substance abuse in teens and children, and then uh, give advice to families and parents. So we're going to start with the cognition segment. Sounds um, great. So the first question, I'll, first question I want to ask you is, uh, in which ways do children and teens come into contact with substance abuse? So that's or a great substances, question. substances, rather. A absolutely. So I, I think that's a great question, and I think that, you know, kids come to, into contact with uh, uh, substances in a variety of different ways. Um, sometimes they're introduced to them in their home environment. Maybe a mom or a dad um, uses them. Um, sometimes they, um, you, sorry. Um, sometimes they have uh, substances uh, that are introduced to them by their peers. There's just a variety of different um, ways that they actually get um, get exposure to them. Um, but most of the time, it's through the connections and the relationships that they have in their life. Mm. Uh, and when you say the connections and relationships, you like you said parents and I mean like not parents, but you said like peers and people. Like at first, like what is the appeal of substances on young minds? Like why do why do kids turn to substances? Well, I think that um, uh, one of the interesting things that we find here at Bacon Street is um, that seventy five percent of our client base has a co occurring mental health disorder. And so what we have found is that oftentimes they come in our door because of, of a substance abuse diagnosis. But the reality is, is that they're using that substance use or those substances to, um, to self-medicate for um, a larger problem, specifically a mental health issue. And so it's often anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, uh, multiple personalities. It's just a variety of different things like that. And so our focus in the way that we go about doing the work we do is we want to treat the whole problem, not just the substance abuse issue. And so 
if we are able to get to the root of the issue for young people, which is often that mental health issue, then we can address the substance uh, use issue along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And you said, so the root of the problem, uh, you said is sometimes it's, it's mental. Like, what are some examples of, I guess, root problems that you've had to dig into in order to be able to treat someone? Um, you know, I, I, as I said before, I'm not a clinician, but I can tell you that my clinicians have often deal with um, uh, clients who have struggled with um, ADD, ADHD, um, bipolar, um, depression, anxiety, um, a lot of those kinds of things really uh, start presenting in young adolescents. And I think that it's um, if going un- undiagnosed and unaddressed, it can really cause some problems in their academics, in their social life, in their family environment as well. So it's important that we um, help provide the tools so that they can um, be successful. And and the way we, we do this is that we're, we're, we provide services not just for a young person, but also for their whole entire family unit. It's important that we don't put a kid back into an environment where they're not necessarily going to be successful. We want to make sure that not only is the child equipped with the strategies that they need, but their entire family unit is also equipped with those strategies. All right. And so what are what are some of the irreversible effects to young minds that are addicted? Because I know that, you know, as we know, like I know with adults, drinking over time or just consuming substances over time can start to have an effect on the mind. Do you know of any irreversible or, or even some long-term effects on the mind of young, on young minds with substance abuse. Absolutely. So one of the interesting statistics that we have found or pieces of data that we have found is that the younger that a young per, uh, person starts to use um, uh, mind-altering substances like this, uh, like marijuana or heroin or whatever, whatever their drug of choice, the more likely that they're going to be uh, become addicted as an adult. And so if you can, um, if a young person starts using at 13 versus starting to use at 18, they're going to be exponentially, exponentially more likely to become an adult addict. And so a lot of prevention services is about um, addressing early onset issues, making sure that we are getting in there to when kids are really young and making sure that they have the supports that they need to be successful, but then also carrying that forward as they age and progress. And and one of the important pieces to understand about adolescent brain development and youth youth development is that when kids are when kids are growing, it is absolutely developmentally normal for them to want to push boundaries and try new things and experiment. That's that's part of becoming that's part of being a teenager and uh, growing into adulthood. And so what we often try and do is we find w- try and find ways for young people to be able to um, redirect that energy, that curiosity, that that experimental nature of their of where they are in their lives to something that might be creative or might be positive. So as an example, um, if you have a young person who you're working with right now who is, um, you know, has, has explored athletics or has explored theater, making sure that they, um, you know, encouraging them to pr- uh, progress and, and, and take that on in a more um, thoughtful way is one of the most effective strategies that we have found to helping kids stop using substances. If you can get them to be passionate about something else, then they're not going to be as, um, um, as likely to use substances. Now, that being said, you know, every kid that we work with and every kid out there has a different brain chemistry. And the challenge with substance use is that many pieces of it is hereditary. And so how do you make sure that the kids who are, who come from a family who might have um, addiction in their in their family background, they, they just have a different, they have a ge- different genetic profile than other kids, and they need to be aware of the fact that they're going to react differently. And so, one kid might, you know, have one um, one drink of alcohol um, and become an addict, and another child might um, have a completely different or have that same drink of alcohol and uh, not have any problems at all. It just really depends on the genetic makeup, and that's part of the reason why it's so important that we are helping kids. Um, 
with their their brain uh, to put off any substance use. Um, it, frankly, from our perspective, completely. Um, but also to help their brains develop into adulthood. One of the um, interesting facts that I talk with folks about regularly is that um, the adolescent brain doesn't stop developing until 25 or 26. And the last part of the brain develop is the, um, the prefrontal cortex. And so that's your judgment center for your brain. So imagine if you are making all of these decisions and trying to come to um, uh, trying to come to, or you're trying to make a lot of good decisions, and you're trying to um, do that without the judgment center of your brain kind of engaging as as effectively. That's part of the challenge of adolescence. So, I know that was kind of long. So, apologize. No, that's a very good answer because you know, parents. That's the stuff that parents need to know. And I, I guess, how would you coach a parent who who knowingly has a uh, a family history of substance abuse to talking to their child ahead of time. Like, you know, if you, if, you know, teens, you know, because as teens grow up, you know, you have to have those hard talks with them about going mm-hmm. to parties and alcohol and drugs and so, so like, how does, how does a parent start that conversation and letting, to let their child know that, hey, well, if we have a family history of, a, you know, of addiction, here are the things that you need to be cognizant of as you go through your teen years. So I think that one of the things that you need to be aware of um, when you're when you're parenting is always to start small, but all, don't don't wait until they're 15 years old to have this conversation with them. You need to have this conversation often and early with a kid. Um, they don't need to know all of the ins and outs and details of um, you know family horror stories or anything like that. But being open and, and dialogue with your kid early on um, is, is is really important to addressing that kind of issue. And so, as an example, I have, my kids are eight. We talk about all kinds of things right now um, as part of um, our parenting strategies. Um, One of the things that is important for them to know is their family history in a variety of different ways and to understand what they carry within them versus what other people might carry within them genetically. And so having that conversation with our kids about all kinds of different things. and. Um, you know, substance use is one piece of it. It, it. it can be mental health. It could be physical health. It could be um, chronic disease. It could be, I mean, there's a lot of different things. And so when you look at holistic health, having a conversation with your kids about what what they have as part of who they are and what their, um, their, their family members <laughs> have given to them over time, uh, genetically is it's an important conversation to have often regularly, routinely, and incorporated so that it's not a big surprise or one big conversation you have with them and that's all you do, so. Right, now we talked about how substances affect the mind. What sort of mental changes should parents be on the lookout for if they suspect their child is abusing substances? I think that you know one of the things that we see a lot is changes in behavior. So if kids are suddenly, you know, if you normally have a happy-go-lucky kid and suddenly they're they're moody and they're uh, they're they're not interested and their grades slip and their friend groups change, all of those are indicators of the fact that there might be something that's going on there. And having a having a regu- regular conversation with your child, knowing who their friends are, knowing who their friends' parents are, knowing um, kind of what's going on in the school environment as well, are all really good strategies for parents to have in their toolbox in order to be uh, successful in their parenting. And what steps should parents take once they realize that they have a child who's abusing a substance? I think it's important to seek help as soon as possible. Um, Oftentimes parents don't realize what's going on until, um, you know, several years after the problem has presented itself, uh, has actually started. So oftentimes we will see parents who bring their young people in, uh, your, their, their kids in to see us, and their kids have been using in some capacity for two or three years, but mom and dad didn't know about it. And so, um, you know, getting them in to see somebody as soon as possible is extremely important. I also think that, um, and you know, research shows that if parents are invested in the process of helping their kids be successful with dealing with this kind of issue, um, the kids are going to be more successful and the, uh, the family, family dynamic is going to be more positive. Thank you for listening to this session of TheraFit. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, holisticfamilysolutions.com, to your friends and colleagues. 
Be sure to check out the archive section of our website for previous podcasts. This has been an HFS production. Join us next time for another edition of Therafit.